1 Peter 4, and we'll look at verses 12 through 19. We'll finish out the chapter. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, I love this study. And uh, I picked uh, the sermon title, uh, The Spirit of God Rests Upon You. The Spirit of God Rests Upon You. The title of the sermon is always one of the verses in the pericope, so you'll have to keep your eyes open for this verse. I always do that. You can count on that. The Spirit of God is resting upon you. And if you were going to watch for something in this sermon, uh, I would suggest you watch for what does the Spirit upon you have to do with persecution? That's what you want to be able to tie together after today's sermon. What does having the Spirit of God have to do with being at odds with community members, maybe being at odds with some of your own family members, what does the Spirit of God have to do with these kinds of difficulties? That's the answer you want to watch for today. So let's start reading. Verse 12. <clears throat> Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that has come upon you as though something strange was happening to you, but rejoice that you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed at the revelation of his glory. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Indeed, none of you should suffer as a murderer or a thief or a wrongdoer or as a meddler, but if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but glorify God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who disobey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should entrust their souls to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Let's start out with just verse 13 there. But rejoice that you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed at the revelation of his glory. Rejoice that you share in the sufferings, you know, when you read that, you kind of have to stop and do a double take. It almost sounds like an oxymoron, like two things that don't fit together. Rejoice that you shared in the suffering. I think that that is very interesting in the culture that we're living in today. The culture that we're living in today, because the culture is, especially if you're on any kind of social media, the culture is to do something or say something or put something out there that will get you likes. Doing something or putting yourself out there in a way that will give you a thumbs up, a, a way that will give uh, the social media community to applaud you, to... Um, be envious of you, to want to like something that you did. And yet what he tells the Christian here is to rejoice when you're shamed. Rejoice when you get slandered. It's almost like if you, as a Christian, choose to post something encouraging, something biblical, and then you get slammed for posting he says, when you get all of those subsequent responses to your post and people don't like what you have to say and people call you judgmental and people blame Christians for the divisiveness, when you're being attacked, he says, that's what the Christians rejoice in. That's what we are grateful for. And before the sermon is over, I want you to understand why would he say that? Why would we be grateful if when we exalt our God, exalt our Savior, exalt our faith, exalt our Christianity, why would we be grateful when somebody 
makes it, tries to shame us for that. <clears throat> what we love, what we rejoice in, the world tries to dishonor us for that. All we have to do is look at the election of our nominee, our Supreme Court nominee, and what's the first attack that she is experiencing already? It's for her faith in God. Possibly overturning Roe versus Wade, and all of that comes from a godly center. Without a godly center, people might have no reason to be bothered by abortion. But if you are reading God's word, if you're engaged in fellowship with other like-minded Christians, then obviously the shedding of innocent blood is going to bother you or it doesn't bother someone else. And so there is a rejoicing when this happens. Let's just look at Acts. Let's look at a couple examples first of people who showed us that they really did rejoice when things got tough. Acts chapter 5 and verse 40. And when they had called the apostles in, they beat them. And they told them, do not speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. And then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple, from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching in that name, in the name of Christ. The reason that the officials <clears throat> wanted to beat these apostles, the reason that officials today want to come down hard on people's faith, the reason a lot of the protesters are forcing people to say a mantra that not everybody agrees with is because Satan's tool is shame. Satan's tool is embarrassment. And that's how Satan tries to control behavior is by embarrassing somebody that thinks differently than the rest of the community. By trying to shame you, by trying to insult you. That's how he tries to get believers to quit speaking out, to quit doing some of those posts because I'm afraid of being ashamed. I'm afraid of someone attacking me and looking bad. But today's message is rather than feeling shame, and cowing down to the pressure. The believer is supposed to learn to rejoice that that happened. Rejoice that that happened. Firstly, he says, for two reasons. Two reasons that we should rejoice. First of all, is if we are suffering in this community, then we know that we will be rewarded when Christ comes back. So he says, hold on to that. Hold on to the fact that you will be overjoyed at the revelation of Jesus' glory. You that suffer now will be overjoyed when Christ comes back because that will be the first validating moment when you do see your Savior returning, when you do see your reward coming down out of heaven for you for having taken that stance he says, that's the first thing to hold on to. You will rejoice in that day. And the second thing he says to hold on to is he says, this indicates that the Spirit of God is resting on you if you are being persecuted for your Christianity. I want to get into that a little bit more. But we can see that persecution emboldened the first century believers, we just have to understand what did they know 
that made persecution, that made being embarrassed, that made being shamed, what did they know that made that a glorious thing? I would hate to just tell you, you're just supposed to smile and be glad because that would be very difficult. Uh, I believe that you really need to know something in order to be able to shift your mentality. And that's what you want to watch for in this sermon. <clears throat> Let me give you another example. He says another thing you can... Uh, kind of hold on to is they did the same thing to the prophets in the Old Testament. Moses, Joshua, Elijah, uh, Jeremiah, all the prophets in the Old Testament. When, we, when you watch the men that received a word from God and then announced God's words to their community, all of them were imprisoned, beaten, Shamed. I want to remind you of that. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. Boy, this is going to be true in any walk of life, whether you're a child that's still in school and walking as a Christian, exalting God and Jesus in your life, saying, I don't do that. I don't participate in that. No, I don't curse. Because God said, don't let any unwholesome thing come out of your mouth. No, I don't get drunk. Because God specifically said, do not be given to drunkenness. You see, my Lord is my God. I'm not seeking my peers' approval. I'm not seeking my workers' approval. I'm not seeking my friends' approval. I'm not even seeking my family's approval. I am reading God's word and I am seeking God's approval. And so co-workers, people at school, Satan's tool is shame and embarrassment, and we have to learn how to stand up under that. Jesus said there's another reason why this persecution comes, John chapter 7, 7. Jesus told his brothers, <clears throat> they were mocking him, saying, you're walking this particular walk, Jesus, and they were mocking him as wanting attention, wanting fame, and he said, look, here's how it works, you guys. The world is going to love you because you act just like the world. And if you're just like them, they'll love you as their own. And he said, but I can't do that because I pledged that I would follow my God's commandments, that I would only do what I see God doing, that I would only say what I hear God saying. I have chose to limit myself in that way in obedience to my God. And so he tells them, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. <clears throat> I testify that its works are evil. And that is the call today. You know, there is a big, a big, uh, uh, oh, I guess, a, a common feeling that we sort of want to try keeping the peace whenever we're out and about, especially because we know what can come upon you. But he says, the reason I'm hated is because I speak God's words. When I see something that's wrong, I identify it as being wrong. When my friends are engaging in behaviors that I know God said don't do, cursing, drinking, <clears throat> When I see that, I say God said that that's wrong. And God said, and Jesus, Jesus, the most perfect individual who ever lived, said that's why people hate me. And so he says, if people hate you because you're sharing in the same sufferings as Christ, if you're getting the same hatred that Christ got because you too are testifying to God's word, exposing what God thinks of certain behaviors, he said, 
When people insult you, when people try to embarrass you, you should rejoice. You should rejoice because great is your reward in heaven. We're living in a world that craves likes, craves followers. Even if it's unpopular, people have a tendency to just fall in with the biggest crowd rather than holding to truths that the Holy Spirit reveals to us. This next verse is going to begin to hit uh, on really the joy of this whole text. It's been so encouraging. So let's just continue on in 1 Peter 4. We're going to look at verse 14. If you are insulted... For the name of Christ, you are blessed because, and here's the phrase, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You are blessed when you are insulted because it means Something And what it means is that the Spirit of God is resting upon you. Uh, I'm just overcome with emotion because I know what that means. I'm going to share this with you. This is the crux of the sermon. This is what I want you to grab onto. What does it mean if the Spirit of God rests on you? I've recognized that... Uh, Peter is following a lot of Isaiah, <clears throat> a lot of Isaiah, whether he quotes him directly or just alludes to him. But again, when he talks about the spirit of God resting on a person, we see that in Isaiah, when Isaiah talked about Emmanuel, who would one day come to turn men's hearts back to God in uh, Chapters 1 through <clears throat> 11, uh, chapters 1 through 11 of Isaiah is a unit, and it, and it starts out with the judgment of Israel for being rebellious, for being just like the nations around them. It's nine or ten chapters of just judgment because you are afraid to stand up for me, Israel. And so he finds them guilty, and he says, because you were afraid to stand up for me, because you didn't love what I love, because you didn't want the ridicule and the shame of the community around you, I'm going to have to basically destroy you. I'm going to bring Assyria in to take out the top 10 tribes of Israel. And then later on, I'm going to bring in Babylon and I'm going to destroy uh, the last two tribes of Jerusalem and Judea. And that's what chapters 1 through 11 of Isaiah tell you. I'm bringing people in to destroy this because you're not being obedient to me. And he goes, but when you look back at the destruction, it's going to look like a burnt forest. Trees are going to be knocked over. What once was glorious and beautiful is going to be completely knocked down. But from the burnt ashes, from the cut down tree stumps, and then here's where chapter 11 comes in. Uh, you need to read chapter 11 because it is hope, it is excitement. He said, after I've put my anger out on you, look at what's going to happen. From the rubble, a branch is going to grow up. This little branch is going to grow up. <clears throat> this branch is going to walk in my ways. This branch is going to be a new covenant and the Spirit of God, here's our phrase, the Spirit of God is going to rest on this branch that's going to grow up. Let's see what that is. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Isaiah 11 and verse 1. There will come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, 
His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord we learn from uh, David is the phrase for obeying God. Exalting God above everything and obeying Him, that is the fear of the Lord. And he says, uh, when this branch comes up, and we know that it's Jesus, he's going to call him Emmanuel, God with us. He's going to call him the Messiah. We know this is Jesus, but there's going to be something wonderful about him. The Spirit of the Lord is going to rest upon him. And what does that mean? It means that he is going to have the spirit of wisdom and understanding. He is going to distinguish between what is good and what is bad. He is going to be empowered by the Spirit to embrace holiness and reject ungodliness. That all comes about by the Spirit of God. The Spirit will give him wisdom and understanding. The Spirit will give him counsel and might. The Spirit will help him walk authoritatively. The Spirit will help him help him walk empowered. The Spirit will be a spirit of counsel. He'll have good news. He'll have good things to share with people. He'll have encouraging words for people that are downtrodden and beat down. He's going to be filled with these beautiful characteristics and traits because God is going to give him his Holy Spirit. One of my favorite things about this verse It is only through the power of the Spirit of God that a person can... Look at the last verse 3 there. Verse 3. The Spirit of God allows a person to delight in the fear of God. His delight will be the fear of God. His joy in his life will be to obey God. His favorite thing in life will be to pour through the scriptures like David said. David said, I I pour through your words day and night. Your words, God, are the lamp to my feet. Your word, your Bible is what I use to navigate my way through life. I delight. I love your commandments. I love your precepts. And the only person that has the capacity to love God's commandments is someone who has the Spirit of God resting upon them. He showed us what that would look like in Jesus when the Spirit of God rested upon a person. And that's why he says, rejoice when you're being insulted. Rejoice when you look different. Rejoice when Christianity and godliness are your joy and your delight Because the rest of the world that doesn't have the Spirit is not going to understand you. They're going to ridicule you. They're going to mock you. They're going to make fun of you because they don't understand you. Rejoice in that day because that means you have the Spirit of God resting upon you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13 Paul had already explained that Christianity was going to make you look weird. Christianity was going to make you stand out for the very reason that you're going to possess the Holy Spirit. And when someone has the Holy Spirit, you look completely different than the rest of the world. Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13. Paul says, this is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths with spiritual words. The natural man does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. They are foolish to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. I hope you're writing these down, chaining these together, because I I believe this is 
one of the most powerful texts for us as Christians to understand why we're going to be at such odds. Such odds with our own family members, maybe even with our own children, with our friends at school, with our community, with our people at work. We're going to be at odds. And this is explaining why it's going to be like that. When the Spirit of God comes to rest on His children, it changes them. It teaches them things that human wisdom cannot teach them. It teaches them spiritual things with spiritual words. The natural man, the man on the outside, the man that's rejected Scripture, rejected God, the disobedient man, that natural person is not going to accept the things that you are being taught by the Holy Spirit. I love that. Unless somebody is on the train with you, looking to glorify God with you, reading the Scriptures with you, having repented of their natural man life, repented of that, been baptized. In baptism we learned that you are making a pledge to God to keep a clean conscience. Why do you need a clean conscience? Because you receive the Holy Spirit in your baptism, and when the Spirit of God is on you, he trains you to think differently than the people around you. As a matter of fact, the people around you, if they're not on the same ride with you, Christianity and exalting Christ as your Savior, if they're not on the same ride, they're going to think you're strange. The natural man will not accept what you're telling him. I hope you'll meditate on these words. Have you ever had a discussion with someone about the evil of abortion? Have you ever tried to have a discussion with someone about the depravity of, of homosexuality? Have you ever tried to have a discussion with someone and you're just beating your head against the wall because you're like, I don't understand how come you don't see it? And you're thinking harder, how can I try harder? How can I help this person see what I see? And the scripture says, Natural people are not going to accept the things that are of God. They're not going to accept the things that the Holy Spirit has been teaching you, that the Holy Spirit has been moving you to be righteous and to glorify God and to be beautiful in God's eyes. You'll never be able to explain that to the world unless you're talking to someone whose ear has been opened. Someone who can hear what you're saying and someone who can say, I want what you have. I want what Jesus is offering. I want what you have. What a glorious day that will be. The Holy Spirit, rejoice when the world doesn't get you. Rejoice because that means the Spirit of God is upon you. The Spirit of God has always been accredited with the good things that a person can do. The righteous, holy capacity that people are brought to. The Holy Spirit on people has also uh, been given the credit for peeping, people being able to have good judgment. You ever seen somebody with really, really poor judgment? Just keep making the same mistakes over and over and your heart breaks for them and you have empathy for them? They just have really bad judgment. It's because they're using human wisdom. I would even go further to say psychology, human psychology. They're using human methods to try to fix a spiritual problem. So another example of the Spirit coming on people. What does the Spirit enable us to do when He rests upon us? Let me take you back to Moses uh, Moses was getting overwhelmed. If you remember, uh, Moses, while he was leading Israel, there came a point where Moses said, God, they're too big for me. Everybody was coming to Moses uh, for their problems. Moses, what do we do? Moses, there's a problem between these two people. What should they do? Moses was the guy. Moses was the, 
the prophet, but the judge. And he went to God and he said, God, I'm overwhelmed. It's too much, God. Too many people, too many problems. I can't do all of this by myself, God. And so God says, okay, uh, you're right, Moses. This is a little bit overwhelming for you. So here's what I'm going to do. The reason Moses was able to lead the people well is because the Spirit of God was on Moses. So in order for there to be other people to lead Israel as good as Moses led them, what's going to happen is God is going to have to give that same spirit that he gave Moses. He's going to have to give that same spirit to more people. And that's what we're witnessing here. Uh, what, what's, what's neat about the story is... Uh, Joshua, I'm going to read this to you, but Joshua comes up to Moses when he realizes uh, Moses is told to pick 70 people. Bring these 70 people and I'm going to give them the spirit that you have, Moses, so that they also can be wise, so that they also can be discerning, so they also can have good judgment. And I'll give you these 70 men to help you judge Israel. But I'm going to give them the same Holy Spirit I gave you. And what's interesting about the story is Joshua comes up to Moses and he goes, Moses, are you really going to do that? Are you going to let other people have what you have? Joshua thought Moses was the bomb because he possessed something that nobody else had. And he didn't think Moses should share it he thought Moses should keep that glory all to himself. So let's read that story together. Numbers chapter 11, starting at verse 28. <clears throat> the Spirit had fallen on these 70 elders that Moses had elected to help run Israel. Numbers eleven twenty-eight. 28. So Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant to Moses since his youth, spoke up and he said, Moses... My Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, Are you jealous on my account? Are you jealous for me? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would place His Spirit on them all. Interesting that Joshua was so impressed with what the Spirit of God could do in a man that he was jealous that other people were now going to be as gifted as Moses. But the only way they could be as gifted as Moses is if God gave his spirit to them. And Moses said, I wish God would pour out his spirit on everybody. Because that way everybody could have discernment. Everybody could have judgment. Everyone could see the spiritual realities that can only be taught with spiritual words by the Spirit of God. The problem is natural men will never be able to do that. They'll never understand those words because they're spiritual words. God used the Spirit to equip His people to do their work, having discernment. And earlier in Peter, we already read that he said, You've spent enough time doing what the world does. You've spent enough time jumping in with your friends at school and being just like them. You've spent enough time doing that. He says, now spend the rest of your time doing what God wants you to do. So we keep going forward in Scripture. Anapa'u, anapa'u is this word coming to rest. Anapa'u in the Old Testament was the idea of the Holy Spirit came to rest on people. But most of the time in the Old Testament, anapa'u, the Spirit coming to rest on you, is in the future tense. I love this part of the, 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 the study. In the Old Testament, most of the time, the Spirit resting on people is in the future tense. Tense. Here, here in Peter, what we're reading today, when he says, Rejoice, rejoice, because it means when you are at odds with 
Worldly people, rejoice because it means that the Spirit of God has rested on you. And when Peter says the Spirit of God has rested on you, it's in the present tense. The first century church was already experiencing something that the Old Testament people only could look forward to. In that day, someday, in the future, God says the reason you people can't obey me is because I haven't given you a heart to do it yet. I haven't equipped you to do it yet. And in the spirit, my, in, in the future, I am going to pour out my Holy Spirit. Just like Moses said, I wish everybody could have God's spirit. He says, in the future, I am going to pour out my spirit on all people. And in Peter, it's already in the present tense, which means God had already begun pouring it out. And he said, this is how you can know if you have it is if you're different than most of the people that you know, if you're different than people that are not saved. Verse 16 in 1 Peter chapter 4. But if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but glorify God that you bear the name. If it is hard for you to stand up for God because of what you know might come to you. He says, turn that around and don't let that be shame. Don't let yourself feel ashamed for loving Scripture. Don't let yourself feel ashamed for loving to live the way God has asked us to live. Don't be ashamed to recognize things that God said are evil and abomination. Don't be ashamed to call those things evil and abomination. No, in your Christianity, if you suffer as a Christian, don't let that make you feel ashamed. Glorify God that you bear the name. Glorify God that you're being pointed at as the Christian. You know, they have a way of making you feel bad for something you haven't even done. You're judgmental. Well, you're legalistic. Where you're, you're, and they like pointing the finger at you. And when somebody says you're judgmental, you're legalistic, you need to stop them right there because you're not supposed to feel shame. And your response needs to be, no, I'm not making the judgment because God makes the judgment. But what I'm doing is I'm testifying to the truth. You need a clear picture in your mind of the difference between a judge and someone who's telling the truth. When you look at a courtroom, In the courtroom, the tallest seat in the courtroom is the judges, and he sits there with the black gown. None of us are that guy, are we? However, next to the judge is a seat that different people approach, and when they approach that seat, that is a special seat. When you approach that seat, you are to swear on the Bible that I will not lie. I will not lie. I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So when you walk up and you swear to do that and you sit in that chair, did you all of a sudden become the judge? No. You're just a guy that swears to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And your truth is going to come from the Scripture. Your truth is going to come from what you've learned, spiritual words that are taught by the Spirit that natural men cannot understand. I promise to tell that truth. So you are only testifying to the truth when you expose the things in your community that are wrong, that God has called abominations. You're not being judgmental. You're not sentencing that person to hell. You're just saying, but I do have to tell you the truth. And God calls that an abomination. I do have to tell the truth. And God said drunkenness is bad. And he's told us to quit doing that. Like innocent, he said, you're going to be like innocent lambs led to the slaughter. You're just going to be saying, I'm just telling the truth. Why is everybody ganging up against me? I hope that in this sermon you're going to find power to understand 
that if you are telling the truth and people around you don't like it, you should rejoice because that means you have the Spirit of God resting upon you. If you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. Glorify God that you bear that name. Thank God that your eyes have been opened. Thank God that your ears have been opened to find out spiritual truth, spiritual realities. Praise Him and thank Him that you have been brought into the fold and pray for these people that are persecuting you because their eyes have not been opened yet. Their ears have not been opened. And so if anything, I would feel a tremendous sense of compassion for someone that's trying to embarrass you and shame you because what that is teaching us is their eyes haven't been opened yet. Their ears haven't been opened yet. And we should have a compassion, a sorrow for anybody that is in that state, that natural state where they can't understand godly things. <clears throat> if we continue to go through the Old Testament, God promised, uh, just as Moses wished that all people could have this same spirit of discernment, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, knowing what to say to somebody. He said, I wish everybody could have this same spirit. Well, God promised it in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. He's explained to Israel, up to this point, Israel was dead. He had judged them. He had found them guilty. They were rebellious. They were stiff-necked. They were still natural men. They were still carnal. And so God brought his judgment on them. But by the time you get to about Ezekiel chapter 33, he starts looking forward to the future. And God said, I'm going to do something in the future to help you. Right now, you don't have a heart to be able to obey me. Right now, you're not equipped, he told Israel, to obey me. So I'm going to do something in the future to help you. And here it is in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. I'll renew, I'll remove that heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. Here's the most beautiful scripture here, 27. I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and to be careful to observe my ordinances. I am going to send you, Jesus called him the helper. Jesus said, I know you want me to hang around, guys, but it is better for you that I go so that I can send you a helper. Someone who is going to give you discernment. Someone who is going to open your eyes to recognize what is evil and what is good, what is holy and what is depraved. I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to equip you to open your eyes to see these things so that you can obey me, so that you can walk in my statutes, so that you can be careful to observe everything that I've told you to do. goes on in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 6, 17 here. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Judgment is this distinguishing between the goats and the sheep, between the fish that you keep and the fish that you throw back. There was a parable once that the kingdom of heaven is like a fisherman's net. And in that net, all kinds of fish get swooped up. But the fisherman opens the net and he separates the good fish from the bad fish. Ron, are all fish created equal? All right. What's, what's your favorite one to catch? <laughs> what about when you happen to land a sucker fish? Is that his... Okay, I remember dad and I would go fishing. We never caught fish, but we, were, we always caught sucker fish. It was like, oh man, 
That's one of the ones you throw back. God says the kingdom of heaven is like that. All kinds of people are going to get caught up in the net, but only a few are going to be spiritually discerned. Only a few are going to be equipped. So some, many of them are going to throw back. Some of them I'm going to keep, he said. He said it's time for judgment to start. We're not waiting for judgment day to judgment to start, but judgment has already started. And the judgment is those people that are being shamed, those people that are told they're being judgmental, those people that are told they're being legalistic, those are the people that are exalting God in their life and have learned spiritual truths. And he said it's already becoming evident who the children of God truly are. He again uh, is using some of the Old Testament here when he talks about judgment starting in the household of God. When God, uh, you know, there are various times <clears throat> when God pours out his judgment, uh, he uses the idea of a bowl when it finally is filled up full. He uses the idea of a wine press that finally has all the grapes and all the grapes are full in there. Uh, I remember we used to have what was called the cider press rally. And you'd have to wind this thing all the way up and you'd fill this thing with apples. And when it was full of apples, what was it time to do? Crank it down. Squeeze the juice out of them. And he says that's the way God's anger works. Uh, God waits and waits and waits until whatever vessel we're imagining is full. And he said, I pour it out. So God, Peter is reminding us of a judgment that God used in the Old Testament and he said it is also happening now within the church. Let me read the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the text in the Old Testament. It comes from Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. Uh, Israel <clears throat> was going totally downhill, totally rebellious. And God said, in large part, it's the leader's fault. It's the people that are dwelling in the temple you know, only the priests got to hang out in the temple. The priests and the elders, the important people that were responsible for giving God's word to Israel. And the reason Israel was faulting is because the people in the temple weren't doing their job anymore. And so he says, one of his prophets, I want you to go to the temple and we're going to clean house. The reason Israel isn't following me is because the people in the temple aren't doing their job, so it's time to go in there and clean house. Now, I want you to make the, the metaphor that the temple now is the church, and the people of Israel is what is the world around us. And he is going to say, if the world around us isn't embracing the gospel, it's because my people in the church aren't doing their job because we're the new priests. So that's the metaphor. Let's read it. Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 4 the Lord said to him, pass through the city, through Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are being committed in it. And to the others, he said in my hearing, pass through the city after him and strike. Your eyes shall not spare and you shall not show pity. Kill the old men outright, young men, maidens, little children, and women. But do not touch anyone on whom is the mark. And here's the word. Where is he supposed to begin? Begin at my sanctuary. Who is he supposed to begin with? So they began with the elders who were before the house. Peter uses this Old Testament analogy. It was a truth that when too much rebellion was happening, God said, it's time to clean house and I want you to start at the temple and I want you to start with the elders. That should kind of send a shiver down our spine a little bit, do you think? He says, people aren't doing their jobs. So we're going to start at the most important place and we're going to work our way out from there. And he says, I want you to mark the people who sigh and groan over the abominations that they're seeing. Isn't that a person that's equipped with the spirit of discernment? I want you to protect the people that when they look at what's happening in the community, 
They recognize what's evil. They recognize what's bad. When you look at your friends or school or the job, you look and you recognize what's evil. The things that people talk about what they did last weekend, it grieves you as something evil. The things that some friends are engaging in with their boyfriends or girlfriends outside of marriage, it should grieve you as something evil. And he says, those are the people I want you to protect. Anybody that's grieved and hurt by all the ugly, bad things that are happening, I want you to protect those people. Everyone else, I want you to go through and slaughter them. Don't feel any compassion. Don't spare anybody. Don't pity anybody. This is the illusion that he's going back to. It's time for judgment to start with the house of God. Peter makes the same parallel. Peter talks about judgment starting in the household of God, in the church of God. Next week in chapter 5, what's also interesting, next week uh, is an exhortation to the elders of the church. You know, when I find correlations like that, I just... I'm so moved uh, that you can tell Peter is following Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, he said, first, start with the temple and mainly start with the elders. And Peter follows this up saying, judgment starts in the household of God. And next week in chapter 5, verse 1, I want you to start with the elders. He follows right along with them. He says in verse 17, and if judgment begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? One of the things that we'll notice about Peter that tends to be not what you hear most of the Protestant churches, most of the Protestant reinforcement is you don't have to do anything. God loves you just the way you are. You're saved by grace. You're not saved by works so that no one can boast. So salvation is all God's work. You don't have to do anything. God takes you just the way you are. There's this cotton candy kind of a thing that goes out. But we've noticed that all throughout Peter, Peter has used the word obedience all throughout the text. He's used the word obedience. He says, you have purified yourself by your obedience. And here he says, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? I want to take a moment to outline this whole idea of obedience that existed all the way back from the Old Testament that God's grace was never to do away with obedience because he said, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit and he will equip you to be obedient to me. So, this idea of obedience, let me take you back to Deuteronomy 18, which is where it started. Uh, the people were telling Moses, please tell God not to speak to us anymore. They were in the wilderness. Mount Sinai was on fire. There were earthquakes and thunder and rumblings. And any animal or person that stepped on the mountain died immediately. And so the people told Moses, Moses, we are terrified. God is terrifying to us. Tell him not to speak to us anymore because we can't handle all of the cacophony of his voices, thunder, fire, lightning, earthquake. We're terrified of him. Tell him not to speak to us anymore. And so God says, Moses, it's okay that they say that. Go back and tell them that I'm going to give them another prophet in the future, and he'll be one of them. He'll be like you, Moses. Let's read that right now. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 17. The Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet for them like you from amongst their brothers. I'll put my words in his mouth 
This is the same branch that we read about, the branch that would come out the stump, and I will, my Holy Spirit will rest on him. This is the same branch. I'll put my words in his mouth, and, and he will tell them everything that I command him, and I will hold accountable anyone who does not listen to my words that that prophet shall speak in my name. We know that this prophet that he's talking about is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And already, <clears throat> while he's making this glorious promise that, okay, I'm going to send them someone just like them so that he's not as terrifying as me. He's already setting up the precedent, but anybody who won't obey that prophet, anyone who won't listen to the words of that prophet, I'm going to destroy that person. So it's important for us to have this understanding that when Christ the Messiah was prophesied, God's anger and wrath against people that would not obey that Messiah was also prophesied. They go hand in hand. Peter picks up on this, Acts chapter 3, probably the second sermon that Peter delivers. And Peter picks up on the prophet that Ezekiel spoke about. So Peter is going to exposit Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18 for us. Let's see what he says. Acts 3 and verse 23. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. We need to learn how do we speak a gospel of grace and faith without undermining the idea that there needs to be a willful obedience on the part of the hearer. It's unfortunate that in most churches today, you only get half the message. You don't get the obedience part of the message. You just get the grace and love and faith message. And that's the, the correct message, right? God has got a lot of grace and love towards his people, but he also said, I'm an impartial judge. You will be judged by your deeds. I don't play favorites just because I love you. If you choose to be rebellious and reject what my prophet tells you to do, my wrath will be on you. We need to balance those out. I think it was Paul that said, behold, the goodness and the severity of God. Goodness to those who obey, but severity towards those who reject his message. I think that's Romans. Romans 10, mm, you ought to look it up. Behold the goodness and the severity of God. <clears throat> Even in the New Testament, John also exposits this idea of obedience to the branch. Obedience to the prophet, John 3, 36 John 3 is the most famous chapter in the Bible. John 3 and 3.16, for God so loved the world. And we're familiar with that, but how many times have you heard people quote John 3.36? John 3.16 gets quoted all the time. You don't hear people quoting this one. John 3 and 36, verse 35, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Again, expositing what we already knew, Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. I will send a prophet. The other message, by faith alone, by grace alone, I want to give you, I want to equip you to understand how that message uh, is misguided, is incorrect. Let's look at just a couple of verses. By faith alone, through grace alone, uh, the first thing is when somebody is pretending to quote that scripture, you're saved by faith alone, through grace alone. Does anybody know where that scripture is? It's not a scripture. It's not a scripture. You think they're quoting scripture, but it's not scripture. They have just made up a motto. So first of all, the words grace alone 
are never in the scriptures. So you should remember that. Saved by grace alone, it's not in the Bible anywhere. Grace alone is never in the scripture. What about the second one? Faith alone. And this is, this is your, your hook, okay? You need to remember this one. And you go, oh, faith alone is in the Bible. You got half of the quote correct. Faith alone is in the Bible, but you said you're saved by faith alone. That's not what that faith alone scripture says. Let's look at it together. You need to know this one. James chapter 2. Let's read through it. We're looking for the words faith alone. And the Protestants say you're saved by faith alone. Let's see if that's what the text says, okay? James chapter 2, verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? So you see that faith was active along with works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Verse 24, you need to pay attention right here. You see that a person is justified by works and not by? You're not justified by faith alone. And yet the motto in most Protestant churches is you're saved by faith alone. You need to write down that scripture. You are not justified by faith alone. Faith without works is dead. Verse 25. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. As the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. <clears throat> Moving on in 1 Peter chapter 4, we'll cover verse 18. If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the disobedient and the sinner? If the righteous person is barely saved. That's why he said that when the Messiah came, it would be a, a period of a refiner's fire. When the Messiah came, it would be like a fuller's soap. The Messiah would separate the true from the fake. And the distinguishing mark is anyone that obeys and believes the prophet will be saved. But anyone that refuses to obey that prophet will have God's wrath upon him. Faith, perseverance, obedience, testing, refining, discipline. This is what's prepared for the house of believers. If this is what God puts believers through, what hope can there be for the unbeliever, for the disobedient? That's a pretty heavy message. So I want to do what the prophets always did. The prophets always had a threefold pattern. The first pattern was judgment. You're doing wrong. You've done wrong. You continue to do wrong. God is judging you. God has found you guilty. You've been hard-hearted. You've closed your ears and you've closed your eyes to God. You know what he wants of you, but you are choosing not to do it. That's the first message. So God has found you guilty. The second message is turn then, turn, quit doing the things you've been doing, quit calling things good that God has called evil, quit being disobedient to the prophet who came to give us God's word and start obeying him, turn from that. And so I want to give us and the listeners the same message of hope. The same message of hope that the prophets always gave. Ezekiel 33 and verse 10. Even though God has found mankind guilty and his wrath is upon the disobedient, God still is willing to forgive and to no longer be angry. 
God is happy to relent from his anger and his wrath and is happy to forgive. And that's what Ezekiel tells us. Ezekiel 33 and verse 10. You, son of man, say to the house of Israel, surely our our transgressions and our sins are upon us and we rot away because of them. So how can we live? Verse 11, say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. Why would you die, O house of Israel? God offers repentance to anybody at any stage in their life. Any stage in their life, I'm willing to forgive, I'm willing to forget. I'll separate your sins as far as the east is from the west. I'll forget them, I'll remember them no more. I have open arms for you to embrace you, to bring you into the fold. And he says, repent and turn back to me. Why would you choose to die? Why would you choose to be destroyed? Why would you choose for my wrath to come upon you once your bowl has gotten full? Why would you choose that? I don't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. What I would rather see is that the wicked would have a change of heart, that you would turn and come back to me, repent, I'll give you my Holy Spirit to help you follow my ways, to give you discernment, to give you a wisdom that none of your friends are going to understand. In Revelation, when we studied about this, Revelation was full of judgment and hope. And one of the things that uh, John the Revelator said in the book of Revelation, uh, Rome was called Babylon. Babylon, because Babylon was the richest uh, city in that time, the richest country nation, and full of luxury and vices and lasciviousness, all of the horrible things that come along with uh, people that are depraved and turned from God. Babylon was the example of that, and he called Rome Babylon. As a matter of fact, if you look at the end of Peter, Peter chapter 5 and verse 13, Peter calls Rome Babylon in 1 Peter here. That's kind of interesting. So he tells them, verse 18, Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. If you have found yourself swallowed up by the world around you, swallowed up in sexual immorality, swallowed up in lust, swallowed up in alcoholism, addiction, swallowed up in anything, He says, come out of Babylon. Quit doing those things. Come out of her unless you do the things that she does and you will share in the plagues that are coming upon her. So Peter gives that message of hope when people had realized they had messed up. They had crucified the Savior. They had crucified the Messiah. What hope was there for people that had killed the Son of God? Could God possibly forgive that sin? Peter gives them what they should do. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter said, repent, be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And here's the phrase, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If being a Christian has complicated your life, if being a Christian has set you at odds with your family members, your friends, the kids at school, your job, if being a Christian has caused difficulty in your life, he says, rejoice. Be glad because that means that you have the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit of God is resting on someone, they learn spiritual truths taught to them by spiritual words, things that carnal people will never understand. So if you are beating your head against the wall, wondering why certain people can't understand, 
He says rejoice because that means you have the Holy Spirit and they don't. That is the answer too. How do you feel no shame when people ridicule you? How do we rejoice when bad things come at us? I praise God and exalt God that he has opened my ears and opened my eyes to see his will when other people have not been opened or their ears loosened to hear. I'm grateful. I get on my knees and I tell him, thank you for your mercy on me. Thank you for letting me be someone who sees your word, who loves your word. Thank you for giving me a spirit that allows me to delight in your word. Thank you, God, for opening my eyes to that. Thank you for blessing me in a way that I delight reading your word. I am so grateful for that gift. We praise God for that. If you need to do a turning, if you don't have that spirit, if you don't have that discernment, if you don't have that delight, maybe a turning needs to go on. You need to know that God's wrath is on the rebellious, but God is standing there in love and open arms saying, turn. Because I don't like being angry. I don't like being wrathful. Turn and come back to me. And I will bless you with my Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, a powerful word today. Love you, Father. Exalt you as the most gracious, most powerful, all-powerful, all-knowing Father, sovereign, creator of the heavens and the earth, the ones who spread the stars across the sky. Father, galaxies that scientists are telling us take thousands and thousands and thousands of light years and that your left hand is on one end and your right hand is on the other end. Father, we can't even fathom you, can't even imagine you, but we're thankful that you've revealed that you are loving, that you are merciful, that you are gracious, and that you love to forgive. Praise you for that, Father, and we praise you for giving us a spirit that has made us different from the world. And we want to remember that when we're shamed or embarrassed, we will glory, we will glory, we will revel in that opportunity because it means, Father, that we have the gift of the spirit that you've opened our eyes and our ears to hear and see that which the carnal world will never understand. Praise you and thank you for your mercy in our life, Father. In Christ's name we pray, amen.